hi, I'm Liz Farrell. I'm the artistic director of painting and drawing and printmaking here at Anderson Ranch. I also am the critical dialogue chair. And I wanted to mention before we start that we do have a silent auction on view in our painting building, as well as our live auction on view up in the gallery. So please check it out after the talk if you have a moment. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to our summer series program featuring museum director and curator Hans Ulrich Obrist presenting his lecture, New Experiments in Art and Technology. As some of you may know, Hans is spending the week here at Anderson Ranch along with artist Alex Israel and arts advocate and writer Bettina Korik leading a critical dialogue program called The Artist and the Patron. This unique program is for practicing artists who want to take their work and careers to a new level. This course guides students deeper into the concepts behind their work and their agency in the contemporary art world. The Artist and the Patron has been a wonderful addition to the Ranch's Critical Dialogue program, which seeks to engage the community in lively discussion about contemporary art and art making. And we are lucky to get the, ch the chance to hear from Hans today. Hans Ulrich Obrist is Artistic Director of Serpentine Galleries in London. Prior to this, he was the curator of the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Vie de Paris. Since his first show, World Soup, the kitchen show in 1991, he has curated more than 300 shows. Hans co-founded with Simon Kastitz the 89 plus, conceived as a mapping of the digitally native generation born in or after 1989. He received the CCS Bard Award for Curatorial Excellence, was made Honorary Fellow of the Royal Institute of British Architects, and he received the International Folkwang Prize for his commitment to the arts. His recent publications include Conversations in Columbia, Ways of Curating, The Age of Earthquakes with Douglas Copeland and Schumann Bassar, and Lives of the Artists, Lives of Architects, of the Architects. Before we begin, I would like to thank presenting sponsor Toby Devan Lewis, premier sponsor Oolight Arts, and others who are making this event possible, including the summer series sponsors, Douglas Elliman Real Estate, Christie's Auction House, and Cultured Magazine, and all of you who support the important mission of Anderson Ranch. I would also like to extend a special thank you to the chair of our board of trustees, Sue Hostetler and Bo Wrigley for generously underwriting the artist and the patron critical dialogue program. Thank you very much. And now please join me in welcoming Hans Ulrich Obrist. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Liz, and thanks, Anderson Ranch, and thank you all so much for for being here. Bettina, Alex, and I are incredibly grateful for this experience of uh, teaching here and uh, uh, deeply grateful for this incredible context. It's, um, I kind of grew up in Switzerland, so I grew up in the Engadin, in the valley, you know, on 2,000 uh, meters altitude where my artists have always worked and where always I did my best thinking. And I think for the first time ever in the world, I met a place where I can think even better than in the Engadin, here. <laughs> Our thanks, Bettina, Alex, and I would like to thank very much, of course, uh, Liz, also Sue Hostetler, Peter Wanders, Lauren Peterson, uh, everybody here at Anderson Ranch, and of course also the amazing research assistants, Madison and Skyer, who do such an amazing job on our, on our course. I'm going to talk today about new experiments in art and technology, but I'm going to tell you a little bit, um, very sort of briefly, how I got there. Um, so basically it all began in the kitchen. When I was a student, I organized an exhibition in my student apartment. Uh, exhibition had a budget of uh, $300. It lasted three months. Uh, it had 29 visitors and uh, became a rumor. And um, in the center of it was a kitchen altar by Tito Fischli and David Weiss, my friends and mentors, uh, the Swiss artists. Uh, you see their piece here. Uh, there was also an exhibition within the exhibition, something which I've done ever since. Uh, I always believe that exhibitions can have exhibitions within them. Um, so Hans-Peter Feldman said he doesn't want to exhibit in the kitchen, he wants to exhibit in the fridge. So this was the fridge show, which was part of the <laughs> kitchen show. Soon after, I organized an exhibition in the Nietzsche House in Sils Maria. Um, sort of idea also of showing art 
where we expect at least going with art into context where otherwise people wouldn't see contemporary art to build bridges is something which has been important for me ever since. And we spent time with Gerd Richter in this valley in Switzerland, uh, and it's there where he did many of his uh, extraordinary photographs. Uh, and this show was the first time that he exhibited his overpainted photographs, which he did in the Engadin, kind of documenting all these mountains around and then overpainting them, of course. These small little works until then had only existed in the Atlas, in his archive, but here for the first time were shown as autonomous works, where he really his abstraction and his photo painting kind of come together. Now, listening to artists um, like, for example, Gerhard Richter uh, has always to do for me about asking them what is their unrealized project. Because very early when, as a teenager, I met artists, Alighiero Voetti said, it's very strange, you know, when you're an artist, you're always invited to these things. Some of them are great, you know, there are biennales, there are galleries, museum shows, but no one ever asks what, what the artist wants to do. And uh, so he said we should really revert that, and he gave me the advice as a curator to always start with the artist's unrealized project. So I would always ask artists what are their dreams, what are their unrealized projects. That's how we got to this show of Richter, for example, and I do this ever since. <laughs> now, this year for the first time, I applied this methodology of the unrealized project to art history, uh, curating this show for the Centro Botin in Santander of Alexander Calder's work, um, finding out in close collaboration with Sandy Rohr and the Calder estate, that Calder had so many projects where he went beyond the exhibition space. He, of course, famously painted the first art car, had also many projects to paint airplanes, of which some were realized. But of course, we have also here an unrealized project for a zoo, where he wanted to actually create these cultures for the animals in the zoo to interact. And we found many extraordinary collaborations with architects, because he knew, of course, many of the great architects of his generation, Oskar Niemeyer, Bunschaft, and all of that became part of the show. Uh, we invited Renzo Piano to design the show because I felt it would be interesting to invite the architect to actually design the building um, because Renzo Piano met actually Alexander Calder when he designed the Pompidou uh, and uh, has always been inspired by this defying of gravity, this almost weightlessness uh, of uh, Calder's art and so he created these sort of floating platforms for the exhibition, a show you can still see which is ongoing. Another advice I got when I was 17, uh, at the beginning of my trajectory from an artist, is the advice from Rosemary Trockel, because Fischli Weiss sent me to Cologne, and so I went to visit Rosemary Trockel. And Rosemary said, you know, it was 85, 86, and Rosemary said, it's very strange, Louis Bourgeois has just become well known, uh, and indeed, she had only just become well known, uh, you know, she was then in her 70s or 80s, and uh, <coughs> Rosemary said, this is really wonderful news, but it's just a problem still, because there are so many other extraordinary women artists who are under the radar, who are not shown, who need to be in art history. So she devised the following methodology. She said, I should just go from city to city and always ask, is there a Louis Bourgeois in town? Are there you know, women artists I should visit, pioneering artists? And that methodology still works in 2019. So about uh, two years ago, I was in LA visiting Bettina and Alex, uh, and they told me about a tiny little exhibition in a, uh, uh, in a space by an artist called Lucita Hurtado, which I didn't see, had just ended but uh, they said it's urgent we visit her. So we went to uh, the apartment and, um, and the studio, and I realized how extraordinary her history was. She's now 98, is soon turning 99, still paints every day. Her history is, of course, you know, begins more than 70 years ago in painting, almost 80 years ago, when she actually uh, started to uh, meet artists like Duchamp, like also she was very close to Tamayo, painted with Tamayo, they influenced each other, and has since then created endless amounts of work, like different bodies of work, uh, has also been part of many different movements without ever being in a movement, because of course she was very close to surrealism with her partner Wolfgang Palen in Mexico. She uh, was also very instrumental in early feminism uh, and in the ecology movement, and she's still today at uh, 98, soon 99, participates very strongly in uh, the fight against extinction, which is the main topic of this exhibition. So we then decided to do her first ever museum retrospective at the Serpentine with more than 100 paintings, which should you come to London, you can still see until October the 20th. Another um, artist I met, again, thanks to the Rosemary Tuckle methodology, is asking artists visiting studios in the US about influences, and they all mentioned Faith Ringgold to me, uh, who strangely has never had a big show in Europe, so we started to work with her on her extraordinary uh, body of work uh, of, of also uh, more than 60 years, her early 
work actually influenced by Guernica, then the connection of cause and strong involvement with the civil rights movement, then the moment she discovered quilts, which is a great story because she actually wanted to, she told us that she wanted to write her autobiography and the publisher wanted to censor her. The publisher said, you know, we need to change your story, otherwise this book is not going to work. So she got really upset and she says, you know, this is my story and I'm not going to change my story. And that sort of do-it-yourself spirit in which I believe a lot, she uh, just decided to do it anyhow and publish her uh, text uh, on these uh, externary quilts. Uh, here there are more visual quilts, but there are these text quilts. And then of course the rest is history. These quilts entered the world. Uh, Random House, uh, someone from Random House said we need to make a children book. And ever since, you know, dozens of children book, millions of children grew up with uh, Faith Ringo's book. But yet, you know, there has never been a retrospective of her work in Europe. So that's where the protest against forgetting uh, is very, very important. Talking about do it yourself, what I learned from Christian Boltanski, whom I met also as a teenager, is that we need to come up with new rules of the game. That um, uh, in a way we need to come up with new formats. Uh, we started with Boltanski uh, 26 years ago, this show called Do It, which has happened in more than 160 cities until now. And it's basically an exhibition where we invited artists uh, following Boltanski and Bertrand Lavier's advice to write instructions, recipes, how-to manuals. And this exhibition can be interpreted all over the world. And whenever it happens somewhere, we add local artists. So for us, it also became a way of working differently with globalization. Um, and actually, in a way, always take into account the local context when a show tours somewhere. And obviously, the, the exciting thing is that the archives to that grew. We have hundreds and hundreds of instructions. I brought a few here for you to see. Anna Halprin's choreographic instruction and um, Felix Gonzalez Torres gave us a, because usually his instructions are extremely, extremely precise. And here it was a very open instruction. It just say, take a certain amount of locally wrapped candies and throw them in a corner. And that has, of course, created you know, amazing uh, difference in terms of where this piece has been realized, how it's been executed. And uh, in a way, of course, it's almost like open source. Uh, it is in that sense also uh, taking into account, of course, the beginning of the World Wide Web, that an exhibition could appear anywhere, and that also there are no obstacles, that in a way everybody can, can, do, can just do it. Here, Pistoletto, inviting uh, basically groups to do spheres out of newspaper. And this all brings us then to the theme I'm going to address today, which is the theme of art and technology. And uh, here you have uh, the post-it note Tim Berners-Lee wrote for my Instagram account. Tim Berners-Lee is the inventor of the World Wide Web, and uh, a lot has been written about it in March this year, because the World Wide Web turned 30. And uh, he uh, wrote here his motto for the World Wide Web. This is for everyone. And what he means with that is that, of course, we live in a moment where the net neutrality, which for him is so important, is in danger. So we would have a fast internet for people who pay and a slow internet for people who don't pay. So he objects that very strongly and feels that it would betray and actually endanger the original idea and uh, comes for this reason up with this slogan, this is for everyone, which is very much the motto, you know, for a show like Do It, uh, because everyone in a way can just do it. It's an open source exhibition. But it is also the motto for us at the Serpentine, we want our work to be for everyone. And after having been an independent curator and having curated these many, many shows all over the world, around 2001, 2002, I felt it was time to concentrate. And so then I became curator at the Musée d'Art Moderne de la Ville de Paris, uh, where I started to spend more time. Uh, I was before that, I was the migratory curator of the Musée d'Art Moderne, which was a, a very you know, free attachment. But then I started to curate more regular shows. And then in 2006, uh, I joined the Serpentine as uh, co-director of exhibitions and programs, and now, uh, since uh, three years, as the artistic director. Now, uh, the Serpentine Pavilion started in 2000 with uh, uh, actually the late Zaha Hadid, who has been a mentor. She was a trustee of uh, the gallery, and she always said when we met her, there should be no end to experimentation. And that, in a way, is a motto we follow very much, and she started actually invited by Julia Payton Johnson this pavilion scheme where she would um, basically uh, build a pavilion on the lawn in front of the gallery. And that became something we've done ever since every year. Because a museum usually, you know, sometimes extends, sometimes there is a new wing. Uh, but that happens only uh, every couple of decades. And so to kind of keep the institution dynamic, it's great to, to build a new wing every year. 
Uh, and so we're basically doing this architecture experiment every summer from June to October, and then it disappears, and then it comes back. So here you see this year's pavilion, which is uh, the Japanese architect Yunya Ishigami, the 2019 pavilion. Ishigami built a pavilion made out of 70 tons of slate, which are really almost weightless in the park, uh, floating above the ground. It kind of connects in a, in a way, I never thought of that before, but looking now at the images, it kind of connects to the Renzo Piano display, because it's kind of hovering. And uh, of course also, is extremely spectacular when it rains, because uh, it, it rains quite a lot in London, so it's important that the pavilion also works in the rain. Now this structure of the pavilion is really there for everyone. It's free admission. Hundreds of thousands of people come and they can define the way they use it. So it's almost like you know, it becomes part of the park. And then of course we program events. So every Friday night we do a park night. So on July the 5th, that's the most recent one, Precious Okoyamon, an extraordinary young um, a New York-based artist, did a theater play uh, as a performance, The End of the World. Here are so image, some images from that. And you can, of course, see all of these you know, films online. And then we felt, and that really brings us to technology, because it's not only the meeting with Tim Berners-Lee, whom I met, which made it urgent to kind of think more what we could do with technology, but it is also the meeting with an extraordinary artist and, uh, and writer called Ben Vickers, who, whom I met maybe seven or eight years ago. And Ben explained to me that he just thinks that institutions are missing out on experiments with technology, because he feels that they're working on websites, sometimes they are online projects, but how could one put this in the center of the institution and really develop, in a way, a mixed reality where the digital and the analog would kind of coexist in a, in a non-hierarchical way. So um, we invited Ben to join the gallery about six, seven years ago as our digital curator, and then appointed him as the CTO, because we felt there's no reason why, I mean, uh, museums usually don't have a CTO, but most you know, companies and brands have a CTO, so we felt uh, it would be more urgent in a way, a CTO than a digital curator. We, of course, then also hired a new digital curator who works uh, with Ben, and this is the uh, uh, augmented reality pavilion. So kind of in terms of these parallel realities, we thought it would be interesting this year for the first time in um, addition to this Ishigami pavilion, to invite an artist to do a uh, augmented reality pavilion. So together with the Google uh, Institute, we developed this Jakob Knut Stinson project, and um, visitors are invited to basically download the app, the Deep Listener. Stinson says, you know, it's important in the 21st century to listen to the planet. It's important. Uh, this is very much a project also about extinction. He uh, uh, has a very strong ecological focus with this piece. And uh, six sites in the park have a pop-up moment where this pavilion can be seen. Now, the amazing thing is also that every year, you know, we go through a very, very complex process to get planning permission for our pavilion, health and safety, et cetera, et cetera. It's very complex. There are many constraints. However, what we found out is that with augmented reality, there is no planning needed. We can just have it in the entire park because basically, you know, it's not physical. And it's also, of course, very exciting because it invites visitors to a walk. So um, uh, that basically is our first augmented reality. It came out of an open call. Jakob Kruz Stinson is the winner of the open call and was um, co-directed with the architect David Adjay, who, uh, who mentored this project with us uh, and was on our side, uh, as he is also on our side with Richard Rogers when we do the um, pavilion, you know, the physical pavilion, the analog pavilion because of course we are not from the architecture world, so it's important to have architects with us in this uh, adventure. Digital commissions started to happen. Here you see James Bridle, the Cloud Index. This is a digital commission which basically connects uh, the weather patterns uh, with the political cycles and political events. And then uh, Ian Chang with Bad Corgi. This became basically a story. Maybe we can activate this video.
And then, of course, at some point, the question was, you know, how could one actually bring these digital commissions into the exhibition space? So one of the first experiments was actually last year with Pierre Week, who uh, invited visitors to experiment images from artificial intelligence. He worked with a lab in, in uh, Kyoto, where actually a scientist would sit at the machine, and he would basically feed the scientist with images, and they would directly go from the brain of the scientist to the machine, and the machine would then search what is the image the scientist think of, and you know, the searching for the image is what he somehow visualized, and it's an exhibition which became a living organism. The visitor experienced it together with 100,000 flies, and uh, also it would never repeat, and that, of course, is, is the second thing we realized. The second thing we realized is uh, not only do you not need planning permission in terms of the park, but the second thing we realized is that uh, it means a completely new art form is born because you no longer have a loop. Because moving image so far has always been connected to a loop. At some point, the video or the film repeats. Whilst these AI installations, as long as there is electricity, will never stop to reinvent themselves. They are like complex dynamic systems which always, always evolve. And that, of course, will, re will lead to a completely new experience to live with moving image and also of having a presence of moving image in public space. It opens a whole avenue, of course, for, for public art. Here you see the installation. Soon after, we invited Ian Cheng to show the animations and at the same time also uh, to actually work on his project, which is called Bob. Now, Bob is a um, virtual creature. It's basically the first exhibition we have which has a central nervous system. And that led to quite extraordinary experiences in terms of the visitors. I was reading the other day the, uh, the guest book where people leave their comment. And uh, somebody, for example, said, I came all the way from Birmingham and Bob ignored me. And uh, somebody else said, you know, Bob was so nice to me that I came back every single day of the exhibition. So a completely you know, different uh, new experience. Uh, Bob has evolved since then. It's also possible for visitors actually to put up their own Bob Shrine. Bob stands for Bag of uh, Beliefs. And again, it's an artwork you know, which was never twice the same. It, uh, it, it was sort of liberated from, uh, from the loop. And we can say that in a way, you know, making invisible the visible is of course an important aspect of these new technology you know, projects. Growing up in Switzerland, one of the first artists I came across was Paul Klee. And Paul Klee uh, said that art's power is to make the invisible visible. And of course, we are surrounded by technologies which we, first of all, barely understand and which in big parts are invisible. These are invisible algorithms. So I think it's very fascinating that artists now, in a way, start to make this invisible visible. There is, of course, also an interesting connection to Marshall McLuhan. In the introduction to the second edition of his book, Understanding Media, McLuhan noted the ability of art to anticipate future social and also technological developments. Art is an early alarm system pointing us to new developments in times ahead and allowing us to prepare to cope with them. So in a way, art like a radar in environment. And that, of course, leads us then also to a completely uh, new way of using technology uh, as Sandra Perry did it, often taking her own life uh, actually as a point of departure for the work. We see this in the next image. She makes work that revolves around black American experience, the way also in which technology and identities are entangled. To quote Sandra, when making a piece, I want people to feel like they have space and agency. So to basically use technology in a way to give people space and agency. So she would use digital tools, blue screen technology, 3D avatars, which were in the show, and found footage from the internet. And here, another quote from Sandra. Here, the display. I'm interested, she says, in thinking about how blackness shifts, morphs, and embodies technology to combat oppression and surveillance. And that, of course, leads us also to another exhibition, which is the exhibition of uh, Arthur Jaffa, which was his first uh, museum show. I met Arthur Jaffa in the early 2000s when I did a show with him in um, uh, Korea. And he then left the art world and worked a lot with film directors, worked with, uh, with music, and uh, then through the Hammer Triennial really came back into the art world where, uh, where we saw the work and invited him to basically do the first solo show. And it was very fascinating that he 
developed uh, an experience where he actually, his idea, you know, that this is for everyone of Tim Berners-Lee, which is kind of the core of what we do at the Serpentine, what does it mean? It means free admission also of the galleries. It means uh, the pavilion. It means doing public art. It means we did Christo, for example, last year uh, in, in Kensington Gardens. Our chairman, Mike Bloomberg, had, of course, done the gates with Christo in, uh, in New York. And thanks to Bloomberg Philanthropies and thanks to the mayor of London, you know, this uh, uh, very, very big 20 meter high mastaba of Christo could actually happen in, on the lake of, uh, of the Serpentine. And in a way, that, of course, uh, means that we uh, go also to, to visitors who would never cross the threshold of the museum, which we think is very important. Because the other day, I basically uh, came back early from a trip, and uh, uh, very early in the morning, and a taxi driver who dropped me basically says, you know, he wanted to tell me a story because he's sure I'm working at the Serpentine because no one would go there at 6 a.m. who wouldn't work there. So he said he wanted to tell us the story of his daughter, that you know, they came to the pavilion and the daughter had an epiphany and now wants to become an architect because she you know, stumbled across the thing. And then I asked him if he had come to see the shows and he said he didn't. Uh, and I said, why? And he said, because he doesn't think it's for people like him. So there is still you know, this threshold and we need to address that every day. And by going with public art, uh, that is one movement. And then Arthur Jaffer's show happened and he undermined the idea of a solo show. He invited several other artists, which was wonderful to give them visibility. But he said something very, very crucial. He basically said, um, we also need to go into other neighborhoods in London. And that led now to a whole collaboration we are having with Barking Dagenham, uh, basically the um, uh, borough in London, about 30 minutes from central London, where Ford used to be and when Ford closed, uh, basically the entire borough was unemployed. So it's one of the highest unemployment rates in youth in the UK, and we found out that basically a majority of people had never been to uh, central London, a majority of young people. So that gave us then the idea to actually go with the Serpentine there, which was, again, you know, it's always listening to artists. Now, it's interesting if we think about Arthur Jaffer and this idea to go with an exhibition everywhere uh, and also beyond the art world, that has a lot to do with all the conversations we are having in the seminar here with Bettina and Alex, because of course, Alex Israel, uh, who is here and whom you all know, has for many years now created all these multiple parallel realities. He would do a film, which you see here for teenagers, very connected to what I was describing about Arthur Jaffa. And this film goes from school to school uh, so that teenagers can see it there. And uh, we premiered it at the Serpentine and from there it then went to many schools in the UK. Another collaboration Alex did more recently, uh, he of course also works with uh, technology and another collaboration which totally goes beyond the art world is the collaboration with Snapchat. And uh, maybe we can see the film here so you can see how it works. Maybe we can see the second one. We have a second. <laughs> now, obviously, this is a whole new dimension to painting, right? It's a uh, painting experience in a new way. And if we can have the next uh, image, so here the collaboration uh, actually with Snapchat, Ku Shong Ah, uh, the London-based Korean artist basically developed uh, a project with Acute Art. Acute Art is a organization producing mostly VR projects, virtual reality projects with artists. Marina Abramovic did one, Olaf Eliasson did one, and Daniel Bjornbaum, the director of the Moderna Museum in Stockholm, uh, has actually just joined Acute and has decided to move from an analog museum to a virtual museum. So we obviously work a lot with the Serpentine and Acute, and what I mean with that is also that this whole idea of new experiments with art and technology leads also to new 
collaborations uh, to, new forms of, uh, to new forms of partnership. Uh, uh, Kushong Art work happens in the Bayelo Foundation. Of course, the Bayelo Foundation uh, has a park connection as we have at the, at the Serpentine. Um, the park there is very important. And she created this uh, basically AR work uh, around the Ellsworth Kelly sculpture. Because there is an Ellsworth Kelly sculpture, you know, and so visitors could actually be there and then pointing their phone at the Ellsworth Kelly sculpture and then that triggered basically the work. Now, obviously, if we talk about technology, uh, we, we need to talk about, I think, or it's urgent to talk about globalization, no? Because we live in an age of globalization. Now, this is not the first time that that happens because there have been previous uh, moments of uh, globalization, um, the Roman Empire and, you know, many other moments. As Rem Kohlhaas always says, you know, there have been many previous moments of, of globalization. But it is without a doubt the most extreme moment of globalization that has ever been, the moment we're living now, fooled by technology. And that, of course, leads us to uh, many extremely dangerous problems. Uh, one is, uh, and this leads us all to Edouard Glissant. And I wanted to tell you today about Edouard Glissant, because for me, he is the most important author of the 20th century. He sadly passed away a few years ago in 2011. He's the most important author of the late 20th century to address the problems, questions, potentialities, possibilities, opportunities of uh, globalization. Edouard Glissant uh, was from Martinique and uh, uh, very early on saw the following situation. He early on saw that the homogenizing globalization will lead to extinction. It is exactly what we're experiencing now, that not only species will disappear, but that also um, many cultural phenomena disappear, languages disappear. Uh, but he said that at the same time, he sees the danger come, and again, he said that 30 years ago, so it's very premonitory, he sees the danger come of a counter-reaction to this globalization, which would lead us to new forms of racism, to new forms of lack of solidarity, to new extreme forms of nationalism as a kind of a counter-reaction to this globalization. So he says we need to resist both and need to find a way what he calls mondialité, which is a generous way of engaging with the global, which at the same time takes local differences into account, which avoids homogenization, which is able to listen. It goes back to what I said at the beginning. I mean, the 20th century was a century of many manifestos. Uh, and maybe the 21st century will have more to do with listening. So anyway, I have a ritual. Whenever I wake up in the morning, uh, if early or late, I always read 15 minutes of Edouard Glissant because it gets my day tuned because I always think, you know, what can I do today to contribute to mondialité, in a way, in my little small way. I think that if we all do that, you know, I think, as he says, uh, it could have a very major impact uh, to the world. Now, interesting is also that Glissant had actually this archipelago idea, because coming from Martinique, he said, you know, the, the exchange, because he, of course, pioneered ideas of creolization, and he said the idea of an exchange between these islands makes the island richer. So it's not because I'm in exchange with the other that my identity is threatened. On the contrary, it's in the exchange with the other that my identity can become richer. And so his entire oeuvre, co co you know, coming from, from Martinique, circulates around this idea. Here a drawing which he did for an exhibition on his work, which Asad Raza and I curated. There are many artists like Philippe Pareno paid homage to, uh, to, Edouard, to Edouard Glissant. More recently, uh, we tried to apply his ideas in Manchester, in the Manchester International Festival, for an exhibition which I curated uh, together with uh, the novelist Adam Thurwell. And it was one of my unrealized projects always to curate an exhibition of literature. And I never knew how um, until I met Adam. And, and so Adam and I, and Adam said, you know, it's really all about celebrating translation. Because whenever we go to a lecture or to a reading of an author, we don't see the interpreter, and we, we, we usually don't hear the, you know, the original language. We would only listen to the translation. So he came up with this idea, which we developed together, which is basically a um, architectural display. We invited Rem Kohlhaas and the young architect Cookies to create an archipelago, like in Glissant. And on each of these platforms, you would have a well-known writer, novelist, who wrote for us a short story, which takes about 10 minutes to read, and their interpreter. So we celebrated the interpreter you know, with them. 
And this new technology, which means these new headphones, which are bone conducting, I don't know how they're exactly called, but it's no longer, it no longer brings the sound into your ear, but it activates the bone so that you hear the sound. So we use these bone conducting earphones, and that allowed you to actually listen to both the translation and you know, the original language according to what, what you focused on. Now, the beauty, of course, is that, um, um, that it's this beauty also to listen to a language we don't understand. I mean, I spend a lot of time just listening to, to these authors in their original text, and that's something Glissant invented. You know, he organized these very beautiful poetry evenings where he would invite poets to, to read uh, without translation. We did give translation, and so, you know, but you could have, uh, in a way, the choice, uh, and that project will continue to tour. And of course, in every city, we will, it's kind of like do it, we will add languages. And of course, at the moment when, you know, uh, more recently, this very sad incident happened that uh, in, in, in London, uh, two people were actually beaten up in a bus for speaking Spanish uh, because people would, you know, not support someone would in a bus not speak English. At that very moment, we need to celebrate the many languages. And that's kind of the statement we wanted to make with this show. He had a legendary Ngugi Batyongo, who was our, uh, in a way, um, uh, how would I say, he was the, the really wise author in it all. He, um, uh, and he basically um, uh, wrote this, this, this short story and uh, triggered then the other text. Now, that project, of course, and, uh, has to do also with how we can actually make discursive events into exhibitions. Because normally, a lecture you know, isn't an exhibition, uh, but how can we actually bring ideas into the context of the exhibition? How can we come up with new formats of experience? And that leads us to the marathon. A few years ago, it's actually 2005, I, I was invited to a theater festival, and they said, you know, they wanted me to stage something in the theater. So I explained to them, you know, I'm not a theater director, but they knew that I have this interview project where I basically, I have always been recording, you know, as I mentioned many times, listening to artists, so I record this conversation. So there are almost 4,000 hours by now of archive. And you know, with many artists, I have, for example, with Glissant, I have like 60 hours. I would talk to artists again and again. And so the theater festival said, why don't we do your interview project on stage uh, and do it uh, as a marathon? So we did a basically marathon in Stuttgart and then in London, where Remco and I interviewed 20, uh, actually 70 Londoners over, over 24 hours non-stop, kind of making a portrait of the city, and it culminated in the great Nobel Prize Doris Lessing, uh, talking about the future of London and, uh, and basically talking about the future and about ecology. She actually uh, mentioned already in 2006 the uh, ecological emergency. And then little by little, you know, we evolved the format. Here, David Argel, Lynette Yadon-Boaki, or John Gray, or Vivienne Westwood, or Etel Adnan. We would have every year, you know, you can see it here, this is the manifesto marathon, this is the work marathon. So we looked, because AI, of course, there is a discussion, would it, would, is work disappearing? Uh, and uh, so we created a work marathon where we had 60 people discuss the future of work. Uh, and then the manifesto marathon looked at, are there still manifestos in the 21st century? And here we invest who presented her ecological manifesto. And then uh, Etel Adnan, in the extinction marathon. So we did a whole marathon on extinction. And now the serpentine, and that's the last thing I wanted to talk about, uh, because I promised that I would not run over time. And I think you're still okay for three more minutes. Um, so uh, the serpentine turns 50 next year. So <clears throat> 2020 is the 50th anniversary. And so there were big discussions, you know, what are we gonna do for the 50th anniversary? And of course this idea of looking back is important, memory is important, we should never forget that uh, Memory, I mean, we have more and more information, and that doesn't necessarily mean that we have more memory, because maybe kind of amnesia is somewhere at the core also of this digital age. But we felt that's one aspect, you know, to develop a new website and really develop the memory of the institution. But we thought very urgently we need to look out for the next 50 years, you know, what's gonna happen 2070, and of course realized immediately that the theme of extinction, the theme of ecology uh, is the key theme. So that will be the big theme of our 2020 uh, anniversary. All programs will have to do with that. Uh, Etel Adnan already announced it in the marathon, which we did with uh, Gustav, uh, which we did with Gustav Metzger. Here she did this very beautiful drawing of the weeping tree. And I thought it's nice for Aspen because I've seen so many extraordinary trees here in Aspen. And it actually made me think of what uh, the filmmaker Agnes Wada once told me, 
that a tree without uh, a day without seeing a tree is a wasted day. So we certainly don't waste our days in Aspen because there are so so many trees. So Etel dig this weeping tree um, connected, of course, and it all connects actually to my studies. And that's uh, because when I, as a teenager, met all these artists, I decided to study art history autodidactically, but I wanted to study ecology and economy because in Switzerland there was this visionary economist who just passed away, Hans Christoph Winswanger, who came from Goethe and says that we can only develop economy theories for the future if we introduce ecological you know, dimensions into it. Uh, and uh, here is his extraordinary book, basically, about money, energy, and imagination in the dynamics of the market process, which is the kind of book I grew up with. Uh, and uh, so in a way, uh, Binswanger uh, was the, the initial inspiration for all this work you know, we are doing with ecology. And of course, it has also to do with healing. Here you see, for example, a show which we did this year of uh, Emma Kuhns. Uh, Emma Kuhns is, we did five years ago, Hilma of Clint. And uh, in a similar way, uh, Emma Kuhns is an artist who didn't come from the art world. She was a healer, and she did this drawing to heal her patients and to heal the planet. Uh, and uh, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, so we did a retrospective of her work, uh, which we actually now toured into the Engadin, into the Swiss mountains, where it just opened the day before yesterday, in this new museum in Schusch, which is an extraordinary new private uh, museum of the Kulchik family, where basically, uh, the, um, uh, where basically the, uh, uh, the rock is part of the museum. And of course, there couldn't be a better place after London for these drawings to go. Former Fantasma is a project we are working on as well for next year. Uh, we have not only art and architecture and design, so we're going to look into ecology and design. And Pharma Fantasma have a whole practice as designers of recycling. They, for example, not only recycle many materials for their design, but also all of these you know, smartphones, uh, which create such an extreme form of pollution when they're thrown away and crea create design objects out of them. So they have a residency. And of course, that ties in also with the collaboration with uh, uh, the Luma Foundation. Uh, we're working very closely with Maya Hoffman's Luma Foundation in AL in, in partnership. Uh, and of course, the Luma Foundation has as its core mission in AL uh, ecology, art and ecology, and has a whole project in AL where actually designers produce sustainable objects uh, uh, using local resources, lo using you know, local uh, materials. This is another reading recommendation besides Binswanger. This is you know, the extraordinary book of Elizabeth Colbert, uh, which is really all about our time, the time we are living in. Uh, and as Gustav Metzger always told me, you know, this book is a wake-up call and, and a very urgent book to read. Now, talking about, and this is the very last thing I'm going to mention, uh, talking about extinction, we are not only losing species, but we are also losing cultural phenomena. I mean, uh, there was an article the other day I read that there never more languages have disappeared than now. It is a basically mass extinction of languages. And, and uh, uh, I see this in Switzerland, where the fourth language, Switzerland has German, French, and Italian, but the fourth language is the wonderful Romansh, the language of the mountains, and that language is spoken by less and less people. So, so in a way, to resist the disappearance of languages is an important thing. And then, of course, uh, uh, I visited Umberto Eco, and that led to actually the handwriting project. Because in a way, uh, I had this conversation with Umberto Eco uh, in Milan about, um, about what we lose, about languages. And he said he's, even, he's as worried about the disappearance of handwriting and doodling. He says that he knows all these extraordinary teenagers uh, and people in their early 20s who are so brilliant and so bright, but when they handwrite, they handwrite like five years old. And he just thought this is really terrifying. And, you know, uh, and obviously he was, you know, he was in his, I would say he was a year or two before he passed away, so he was in his late 70s, early 80s. So he had a, you know, very traditional idea. He said, we need to send everybody back to calligraphy class. class. And then I kind of went home from this meeting, and I thought, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, but still, we should do something, which is actually realistic. And then I suddenly, and I never knew what I should do with Instagram, because I was somehow at the loss how I should use it. Um, and, I, and yet I was on it, because the artist Ryan Trekartin had downloaded the app you know, on my phone and had sent a message to all his many followers that I had joined Instagram. So it was like a drama, and I didn't know what to do with it. And so then all of a sudden, it was kind of like very strange leaving Umberto Eco's house, and then the next day I was at the Latin, 
and then sh we, it was raining and we were on a walk and then we needed shelter from the rain, it was in Bretagne, and then we were all having a conversation and after hours it was still raining. And then basically after about three hours of conversation I started to do some emails. So did uh, my partner Kushan Rao who was there, so did Etel's partner Simon Fatal. Um, and of course Etel, who is 93, didn't. And she took her notebook and wrote a beautiful poem. And then I connected that to what Echo said, and I, suddenly I just took a picture, posted it on Instagram, and I thought I could make my Instagram into a movement against the disappearance of handwriting and doodling. And by, by doing something with Instagram, one is actually not supposed to do, because it's an image sharing platform in a way. So here are a few examples. You're talking about doodling. Oscar Murillo, who is actually here uh, in, in Aspen. Oscar, of course, has, has this extraordinary practice to, to doodle. In his new show, there is a whole film where you, you see him doodle in the most intense way. So he makes a major contribution to keep doodling alive. Here you see his post. Uh, Norman Foster in his inimitable handwriting, that the power of art is a cause for good. And then, of course, with Chances Prayer P. Orridge, you have the inv invention of their own handwriting, which might be difficult for some of us to decipher. Uh, that's a whole other aspect in the project, that there are many you know, different forms of handwriting. Faith Ringold with her motto that anyone can fly, all you've got to do is try. And then, of course, Jonas Mekas. Uh, I met him very often, so uh, with him it was all about handwriting. And Ku um, Shong Ah. Uh, Anri Zala. So that's another story, because with Anri, there is actually still many artists who are not on Instagram. They don't want to join or they left. So Anri is basically the artist in residence in my Instagram. Or if we go back to the beginning of the lecture, you know, the fridge in the kitchen. So we have Anri in my Instagram. So Anri sends me by email a clock every week and then I post it. So, you know, in that sense, it's like a show within the show. Barbara Chase Ribu. She has this practice of automatic writing. And that, of course, is a long history of that, you know, if you think about surrealism and so on. And then, of course, many different ways of using the post-its. I always would give the artist or architect or poet a post-it to write their text. And so, obviously, the post-it as a medium can become something completely different. So, Alex also did one of the exquisite corpses. And, and that's, uh, that's a whole other... That's a whole other story where basically um, we, we developed um, a, new, a new rule of the game within it. Because of course, after a little while, I felt like it was a bit like a prison, you know, because I, I always thought there's nothing else but handwriting and doodling I can do on my Instagram. And then I suddenly realized that there was this surrealist tradition of uh, the exquisite corpse, which the surrealists love to do. So, you know, you take a piece of paper and then you fold it into four, you know, parts, the other way around. And then, you know, somebody would start and make a drawing and mark where they end. The next person cannot see what you do, continues, and then the unveiling happens. It's a wonderful game. I can only recommend it. And it's a great, it's a great game to play with friends. And the Surrealist uh, did it all the time. And, and, uh, and so we started to think, because sometimes I'm with more than one artist, two, three, four, five, so then we do exquisite carbs, and that was one of the early ones, the collaboration of Alex, of course, is the writer Brett Easton Ellis. Rickett is also somehow in residence in my Instagram. He's probably done about 60 posts, but he in the meanwhile started uh, his own Instagram called Freedom Cannot Be Simulated. If you don't follow him, that's urgent. Virgil Abloh was here. And then the two last ones I wanted to show you is the day of the opening, of the uh, few days before the, um, before the opening, actually two days before the opening of the London show of uh, Faith Ringgold, she was installing, we were installing, Donald Trump visited London, and that prompted her to do this drawing. It's again her motto, anyone can fly, all you got to do is try, to the White House, women, let's go. And then last but not least, um, we have uh, Ethel Adnan's uh, image here. Uh, and that's, for me, the motto, in a way, of everything. Uh, so I thought to conclude with that, and thank you all so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can, yeah. You can think of technology in all kinds of different ways. Uh, you know, sometimes people think of it as a tool to let them do things they couldn't do otherwise, or sometimes we think of it as a force that pushes here or pulls there or destroys this or creates that. 
what are some of the ways you've been looking at this for a long time? What are some of the ways that you've been thinking about technology or you've heard other people thinking about it? Yeah, I think that's uh, interesting in relation to, to what artists do right now in terms of, in terms of mixed uh, reality because I think that uh, the experience, you know, we've, exper we've done quite a lot with virtual reality uh, and that was, for example, very, very fascinating with Zaha Hadid because when Zaha Hadid passed away, we did a tribute to her and, and, uh, and at the same time extrapolated her drawings into VR. And so you obviously could enter these delirious spaces she could never build, you know, these many multidimensional spaces. But so that's, there's a great potential to it. But then I saw all the visitors in the exhibition wearing these goggles and not seeing the others. And I suddenly thought, you know, the experience of, of an exhibition is that we are there with someone else. It's a shared experience and it's, it's, uh, uh, it's just, in a way, felt very strange. And so that's why I think that mixed reality, in a way, what I've been showing a little bit with uh, the three, four examples, no? The, the example of Alex, the example of, of Ku, the example of the virtual, the, the augmented reality pavilion of Jakub, that of course is the beginning of this idea that we can actually see each other, we can see the park or the exhibition, and then if we want, add another layer with, you know, with the phone. Um, of course, the next step for that will be that it happens through the glasses, and already artists are very interested in Magic Leap, and uh, the next step will be that we actually no longer will need the phone, in a way. But I do believe that that idea of mixed reality uh, has a great potential for curating, for, for exhibition making. Yet at the same time, I think we should also never forget that uh, many artists at the moment, also younger artists, resolutely decide to de-link because they feel that they can no longer concentrate, you know, they feel it is very overwhelming. Um, so I think that that idea, Paul Chan calls it de-linking, is a very important kind of thing. And the, f the way how, how we edit time, that there's times we link and times, you know, we de-link. And uh, for example, when I go to a studio visit, I just would switch off everything. I would never look at my phone. So there are these moments where we completely de-link. And I think that's important in every practice right now. Uh, and it will be interesting also how in the future maybe exhibitions can reflect that. You know, maybe we can do de-linking exhibitions. I mean, for example, when we did the uh, Marina Abramovic show in, uh, in, at the Serpentine, we, and we always do this when we do exhibitions, you know, we work very closely with the artists who can take over the building in a way. And so then Marina said she really doesn't want anybody in the space with a phone uh, nor with any other, you know, device. So we, we installed a whole situation at the entrance and people had to leave their phone and it was a purely, you know, uh, uh, non-connected, you know, experience. So to give you another example, uh, a few days ago, sadly, Marisa Merz died, uh, the great Arte Povera artist. She was in her early 90s, I think it was two or three days ago. And it, I'm just writing an obituary of her here actually in Aspen during this week. And, um, and so it made me think again of this wonderful story that I came with the editor uh, of the magazine for whom we did the interview to her apartment. And, uh, you know, we took out our recording devices and she looked at, at us completely flabbergasted and she says, you know, I don't like machines. So then, um, uh, basically, uh, we tried to convince her that, you know, we needed to record this conversation. And she just said that, you know, she didn't uh, want this to be recorded because she always felt physically uncomfortable in the presence of machines. She once bought the TV and it made her uncomfortable. So this is great artist and obviously we cannot, you know, uh, in a way contradict her because she uh, was so convincing. Uh, so then I thought, yes, I want to do this interview. So then I suddenly remembered that there used to be stenography. Um, so, you know, we did stenography, uh, my colleague and I, and together somehow managed to, you know, to transcribe it. And it is certainly one of the most memorable interview experiences for me ever. So I think we should, you know, experiment. And I think the idea also that very often th the quote I was reading, you know, initially about the early alarm system, I think we should also listen to artists' alarm system in relation to these technologies. I mean, Peter Steyer at a certain moment when we worked with her said, you know, there's not only AI, there is also AS, you know. There is artificial intelligence, but there is artificial stupidity, you know, all these bots and so on. So, that, that a few thoughts, but it's, an Im it's a huge question. We could go on forever on this. <laughs>